Uh, okay, everyone, welcome to the IEEE Distinguished Lecture. So today we have a great speaker, uh, Professor Shu and Mao. So now I will have a very brief introduction to uh, Professor Mao. So Professor Mao received his BE and ME from the Tsinghua University, and then he received the BS and uh, he received MS and PhD from NYU. And uh, so he, uh, he held a uh, Mike Wang endowed professorship from 2012 to 2015. And then uh, Samuel Jin uh, endowed professorship from 2015 to 2020 in the ECE department of the, in the, at Auburn University, Alabama. And uh, he is a professor and uh, a Earl uh, C. Williams uh, eminent uh, uh, scholar chair and the director of the wireless engineering research and uh, education center at Auburn University. And he has a wide interest in research that he's interested in wireless networks, multimedia communication and smart grid and so on. And uh, 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 he, now he is a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Communications Society and uh, he held an editorial uh, board a role in many, many societies, in many, many journals, including TWC and TS, TNSE and so on. Uh, he received a number of uh, great awards, including the IEEE ComSoc TC CSR Distinguished, uh, Distinguished Technical Achievement Award in 2019, and uh, NSF Career Award in 2010, and uh, several uh, ComSoc Service Awards. And in addition to that, uh, he received a number of best uh, paper awards, including journal papers and conference papers. For example, uh, he received IEEE Vehicular Technology Society 2020 Jack uh, Neubauer Memorial Award and uh, the IEEE uh, 2004 uh, Communication Society Leonard G. Abraham Prize. Right, so he's really amazing in terms of everything. And, and he's a fellow of IEEE and a member of ACN. Okay, so this is the introduction. So now uh, let's welcome for Professor Mao to talk about machine learning for wireless communications and the networking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mingyue, for the uh, introduction. So yeah. Uh, it's really to see an uh, old friend uh, after we, we have not been able to travel for so long. I think last time it was uh, in California, right? The PI meeting. So anyway, uh, thanks uh, David and uh, Mingyue and uh, Nida for kindly hosting my talk. And uh, I, I, uh, I was appointed as DL starting this year, but uh, this is actually my first DL talk. So to Com Communication Society chapter chapters, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. So um, this talk is about machine learning. So we, we started, uh, we, we, actually we are not an expert on machine learning. We, well, we, we started to work on this problem in a few years back, starting 2014. And um, so basically it's a, more like a what, how we feel and uh, uh, our lessons learned. And uh, so I just to share with you some of our thoughts and uh, experience. And this is a joint work with my students, uh, Xu Yu Chao and Ti Chao. And um, I feel lucky I have uh, very capable students so to, to work with them. Um, actually, they, they did the most of the work, actually. <laughs> I'm just talking about it. So this is the outline. So uh, we, uh, I'll start with the talk about the, the generations in wireless uh, this uh, evolution of wireless technology. Then I will talk about a few examples, motivating examples, and the three case studies. Then eventually I'll summarize with some discussions on challenges and thoughts. Um, so we, we have seen this kind of uh, charts many, many uh, times in textbooks and everywhere. So the wireless technology has uh, evolved uh, starting from the 80s then to the, till now. So there are five generations. Okay, each generation lasts like 10 years to develop. So starting from ideas or visions and uh, uh, demands from uh, then research, then uh, fundamental research, Research, then uh, applied research standardization and then commercialization. So, so what do we mean? Actually, the question I want to ask is what do we mean by generation? If you look up the dictionary, then it means um, 
a generation is defined by a new and fundamental and disruptive technology. Okay, a it represents a paradigm shift from the previous uh, um, generation, and it applies to uh, the technology. Will applies to most devices. Okay, so if you look at uh, this chart, then from one G to four G, um, it fits this definition very well. So uh, every generation has a, a key technology like 4G that is LTE advanced and 3G like CDMA, WCDMA. So, but how about 5G? So 5G is very different. So there, there's a lot of, uh, a large number of different technologies people want to put into the basket of uh, 5G. And uh, the standardization wise, then they are, they also define, people also define three very different uh, kind of networks and services. So that's why we get this kind of a 5G flower. So you have multiple dimensions, very different uh, um, uh, specifications and the, and the requirements, um, performance requirements. And how about 6G? I, I, I was, it, it seems like this trend will go on. Then how do we, why do we call it a 5G or uh, call it a generation, right? So if you look at the, uh, um, uh, these uh, technologies and uh, what people are doing. And uh, so there's a lot of interest, uh, uh, growing interest in artificial intelligence or machine learning and uh, to apply those to uh, uh, wireless networking communication problems. So maybe I I'm just conjecting. So maybe intelligence AI and the machine learning would be the uh, definitive kind of feature or unique uh, um, technology that can, that, that presence in such very different kind of networks and in the next generation. So that means that this is a kind of becoming more and more important. <clears throat> so if we look back, okay, at the, these hardware platforms. So starting from like the 90s, we see the, the rise of PC, okay. And the rise and for PC uh, featured phones, this curve, then um, yeah, and then uh, starting 2007, the first iPhone, the smartphone, is uh, um, is available. Uh, is on the market. Then we see the the dominant of uh, uh, smartphones. Okay, so many many like uh, our office, our desktop uh, gadgets, and uh, uh, are, are all integrated as a smartphone apps. So with a smartphone, you can do any everything. And later on, you see this right curve that is uh, marked the rise of the uh, GPUs. <clears throat> so that is uh, as driven by the uh, deep learning uh, interest and uh, work in deep learning. So that, that indicates the, uh, the, the time for uh, AI and machine learning. That is, uh, uh, we can, this curve will continue to grow as expected. So, um, so the time is right for, uh, for applying those uh, uh, machine learning techniques to, to, to in our field. So um, there has been a lot of success in other fields like uh, NLP, image recognition, gaming. So those kind of, those kind of success can be um, replicated or transferred into our field. Um, like some, some machine learning models that has been proven to be effective for some, for, for some image recognition problems, then we, we probably we can, uh, replicate that to uh, apply that to 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 our wireless communication problems <clears throat> yeah and um, there has also been some epic events uh, it is similar to Elon Musk he shoot this uh, uh, Tesla roadster car into uh, into the space so it's something like that so basically it triggered a lot of interest in, in our community. Uh, but behind this kind of events is the technology that has been developed to, to, to support, uh, to make it, to achieve this kind of success. Uh, like uh, this in gaming, the beat human players. And uh, um, yeah, yeah, I was, I remember uh, 1997, I was uh, with the IBM China Research Lab and uh, there was a lot of, lot of excitement about this uh, Deep Blue it, because it beat um, a world chess champion. Uh, Casper Roof, yeah. So we, it made us uh, very proud to be a uh, IBM. And um, the technology is ready. Okay, there's uh, availability of uh, data. So there are a lot of data sets, public data sets uh, you, can, you can make use of. And computing power is uh, 
greatly enhanced and they are often source platforms like uh, TensorFlow, right? So um, when, we, when we started uh, a few years back, we have initially we have to write everything from scratch. Now it's like the based platforms you can, a, a student can maybe in a couple of weeks can they can uh, quickly uh, master all the techniques and uh, become an expert on applying uh, machine learning. So it, it, it lowered the bars and make it easy for, for wireless engineers to enter okay, the field. And um, the computing power, smartphones are very powerful. Okay, they are powerful, more powerful than the computers used for, used for land, moon landing and uh, used in space shuttles. And uh, another from the, uh, on, on the other hand, the network, well, its network size are quickly increasing and the network becomes um, heterogeneous and more complex. There's course layer. You have to consider many, many control knobs, different layers. So that will usually lead to uh, lead to uh, very complicated uh, problems, and they are very hard to solve. Okay, so using traditional like optimization kind of techniques, and uh, uh, in addition, while it's design. Uh, historically, they are based on like a uh, probabilistic uh, models. So we have uh, traffic models. That's a stochastic process. We have channel models. That's uh, we have probabilistic channel models. Uh, inference. Th these are all uh, probabilistic models. And uh, so while it's while it's designs, I, I think they can they are fault tolerance. Okay. So yeah. Although like a machine learning, it may not give you a hard guarantee, but. Uh, but Wallace systems historically, it's like that. I was telling my students like, uh, you 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 buy a, a Wallace uh, device, it's probably the the only the, uh, product you buy, but uh, it promises you like a uh, hundreds bits of uh, data rate, but uh, many many times you you don't you don't get that. So uh, it, it's for tolerant. Okay. So um, what a what do we mean by AI and the machine learning? So it started in the before the 1940s and the 50s. And uh, then in the 1980s, uh, starting with uh, artificial intelligence, then machine learning starts in the uh, 1980s. Uh, and the reason they, there's a lot of interest in deep learning. So basically uh, AI is a broader uh, concept or uh, broader uh, area and machine learning is a uh, the sub area of AI. So, and uh, those like uh, um, deep learning, for example, reinforcement learning that we talked about, that is uh, belong to the category of machine learning. And another part of the picture is uh, this regression, classification, clustering. So, so those are the statisticians, what they do. So they, they're doing similar things, but uh, sometimes it's called different names, but it may help it may be helpful to look into uh, some other like uh, fields and other tools. Okay, <clears throat> so um, there is a very uh, good uh, collection of uh, papers. It's called "Best Readings in Machine Learning and Communications." So Comstock has a uh, 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 this uh, kind of series, best reading series. So in different areas. So here is a collection collection of paper and some excellent uh, some like a uh, survey papers. You. Uh, you can uh, so uh, then people have explored a lot of areas uh, using uh, machine learning so far. <clears throat> so next, I uh, will talk about uh, several like uh, motivating examples. Yeah, the first one is uh, wireless networks. So the 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 centerpiece is a wireless channel. So uh, yeah, we need to understand the wireless channel. So historically, there are, have been like param parametric models, like free space model. So there's no obstacles, it's an uh, open space. Okay. And then <clears throat> people found this model may not uh, be realistic un uh, unless you're in outer space. Then there is a two-way ground model. So that is uh, consists of two uh, two beams, the, the, the line of sight beam and another beam like reflected on ground. If you, uh, if you like me, if you use the like NS2 simulations uh, a few years, uh, 10, maybe 10 or 20 years back. So this is the model used in NS2 simulator. So tons of papers are, were written based on this model. 
So, but uh, the question is, is this a realistic model? And then later on, if we consider um, a large number of uh, like multi-pass propagations, a large number of uh, components, then a uh, central limit theorem comes into play then we can derive this uh, really model, region model and the log normal log normal model. But all these are, uh, they, they help, they, they are very helpful to, uh, for analysis. Okay, so, so uh, for, a uh, theoretical study, but uh, they are they are all based on very restrictive uh, uh, restrictive uh, like uh, um, assumptions, and they may not hold true. Yeah, and uh, there are empirical models. So based on experiment data collected in the field, then you apply curve fitting or uh, apply this uh, um, adding like a uh, correction factors. For example, if if your transmitter and the receiver are separated by three floors or two walls, then you add uh, this number of dB of uh, additional uh, attenuation. So, so basically, these are empirical models. They're useful for like a, a fi for for field okay uh, experiments or designs. But uh, but yeah, there, there there are also retreat models. If you know the environment, you can simulate the the beams in the space, and the, the superposition of the beams give you some um, some idea. So um, then there has been this uh, channel estimation models. So basically, we 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 just imagine the channel as a very complex function. Then we can use the basic expansion models to represent the channel. So uh, these edges are the parameters we we, we want to estimate and this UMs that are the, are the, the basis functions like a complex exponential functions or some other basis functions. So then in the in the physical layer we embed a known like bit sequence for training then based on uh, received uh, these uh, training bits then we can uh, solve the equations or estimate these H's. So actually you can see this this is a more um, realistic or useful uh, approach. Okay, and used in many uh, practical systems, but you can see this is actually a regression problem. So we 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 just uh, collect data, and based on data we learn a complex channel function. Um, so another motivating example is that the wireless network systems uh, they are getting they are becoming more and more complex. So this is an example uh, from from this paper. Uh, it's a <coughs> Shenfu Chen's uh, my collaborators, um, <clears throat> we uh, paper. So basically, we consider the this uh, offloading scenario. So there are so for each task, you can choose to uh, execute the task locally, or you can offload it to the cloud or FARC server to be executed there. Then we need to consider the CPU frequency tuning, the wireless channel conditions, and transmission scheduling, and energy harvesting. Uh, you know, if you want to go and go further, and the mobility and handover between these different uh, base stations, and in in the network side, there is uh, also resource uh, allocation. Network uh, is like a slicing of uh, your network resource to support the regular uh, cellular communications or support this kind of offloading data transmissions. So eventually, the problem becomes very complicated. So uh, there's no closed form uh, so, uh, expressions and uh, there are integer and uh, variables. So not the, the, the expression is not differentiable. So basically traditional analytical methods are, very, um, are not very useful to solve this kind of complicated problems. <clears throat> so that is where the machine learning techniques may come into uh, play here. And, uh, Another motivating example is uh, distributed algorithms. So uh, 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 one problem is a distributed power control. So these are the transmitters, receivers, and uh, the, the red dot and the blue dots. So each link will cause interference to other, to other links. And based on the interference you learned, then you make a decision to adjust your transmit power. So it's a digital power control, okay. And also like uh, <coughs> uh, in cognitive radios. So this is the radio environment that shared, uh, the spectrum shared by many uh, transmitters or receivers. And uh, then we, uh, there, there's a component to sense the spectrum, then to, uh, 
to detect the state of the uh, spectrum, the channels, and then make a decision based on what you hear, what you sense, and then the decisions uh, will implemented by will be implemented by software defined radio, such as uh, change to a new waveform, jump to another channel, or um, <clears throat> or um, use a different uh, transmit power. Uh, at the network level, there's an end-to-end -end congestion control. So there's a network cloud. We know nothing. Okay, it's a very complicated, it's huge, it's the internet. We know nothing about the network cloud. But uh, at the end, okay, end user, we, we, we send the packets into the, the cloud network. Then we, by detecting some um, feedbacks, such as the variations in the packet interval times or packet losses, delay, out of sync, out of sync packet uh, sequence numbers by we infer what ha what has what was happening in the network cloud. Then we make a decision on increasing our rate or decreasing our rate. So eventually uh, uh, equilibrium or it will can be uh, is to the the goal is to achieve some kind of uh, equilibrium uh, among all the users to make good use of the, net, the resources in the cloud. So if you look at these kind of uh, examples, they look very similar to the uh, to this, uh, what, what is brought here, the deep, deep reinforcement learning, um, the model. So basically there's an environment out there, then the agent that is like a, a cognitive radio uh, uh, or it's like a, a TCP, a TCP server, okay, or a client. So basically, then we we uh, make a decision that is a uh, decide what is what is transmit power to take to use, and what what data rate we, we want to use, and then after certain time delay, then the decision will impact the environment, then the change in the environment, and uh, that is the state feedback, and then. Uh, what we have, uh, the, the, the action we made will bring also uh, uh, generate some kind of a reward. Then based on the reward and the state feedback, then we make a, a change of, uh, we, we may choose another uh, policy, another action. So then eventually after this uh, action and the reward state kind of this kind of a, a loop, then eventually um, some, some good policy, some uh, maybe optimal policy can be achieved. So actually, you can see this is a very uh, similar to to this to the existing kind of distributed algorithm design. So and uh, I I can imagine that this could be very useful uh, to solve those problems. <clears throat> and uh, uh, there are two more uh, motivating examples. One is uh, indoor localization. Okay, so uh, one technique is called fingerprinting. So basically, in in this is the floor plan. So we had uh, this location, these uh, fixed locations. We we do uh, call the training locations. So we collect measurements, okay, at these training locations. Then we, um, um, such as the me we measure the Wi-Fi signal strength, receive the signal strength RSS at these locations. And and then if we want to determine the location of a unknown device, okay, at an unknown location, so we just uh, collect some new measurements okay, uh, from that uh, device. And then we compare the measurements with what we have stored uh, and then find the, good, the, the, the best match. This is actually a classification problem in statistics or, or machine learning. So, so, so those tools could be very useful to solve these problems. Yeah, another uh, similar problem is uh, it's also indoor localization, but uh, we, rather than uh, doing this kind of uh, measurements at the training locations, so we can um, construct a radio map based on this uh, this blue blue stars. Okay, those are the uh, measurements. Uh, yeah, we 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 can get a sub a set of these kind of measurements. Then use these values. We can uh, reconstruct a radio map. Okay, so the, this is x, y, and the location in uh, coordinates and uh, this z dimension is the receive the signal strength. So then with, once we construct a map like this, then we can use this to uh, estimate location okay, for, for mobile devices, okay. So this is actually a regression problem, okay. So yeah, so there, have, there, there are a lot of uh, 
useful tools from the machine learning statistic field that can be can be uh, used. So uh, in, in this paper, we, we use the uh, deep Gaussian process. Um, so yeah, we we can, so this, this surface, this real map uh, was constructed using like 20% of the measurement data, but you can see uh, it still uh, uh, retains all the other uh, like peaks, valleys, so the other uh, fine uh, features of the of the surface. Yeah. So uh, many many uh, many like uh, Wallis problems can be uh, uh, actually formulated. They are actually uh, regression or classification or kind of machine learning problems. So so that's why uh, machine learning can can be very useful. So in in the following. Uh, uh, slides. I, I will talk about uh, three uh, case studies. So uh, those are the uh, basically what we have learned, and uh, we, we we tried we have tried to apply machine learning tools to to classic or new uh, uh, applications, various applications. Yeah, the first one is called automatic uh, um, modulation classification. So this is a, a kind of a canonic problem in. Um, in um, like cognitive reduce and communications. Okay, so so it's a key component of cognitive redo. So when you receive all, all the kind of an unknown signal, so then we, we need to decide what kind of modulation, okay, it the signal is. Uh, and uh, without any a prior um, a priori information of the signal or channel. Okay, so that's the problem. Um, and this is a uh, an important component of many like uh, applications like spectrum sensing access, anomaly detection, etc. And um, this is a well studied problem. There has been a lot of interesting work and uh, uh, in the literature. So, but we what what we are doing here is uh, that we want to uh, uh, first we want to use this uh, uh, the CNN convolutional convolutional neural network model. So that proposed in this uh, uh, seminal paper uh, by uh, Oshi, Corgan, and Clancy in 2016. So one major contribution of this paper is that it, it provides a data set. Okay, it called a radio uh, ML 2016 uh, data set. So the data set consists of a synthesized uh, uh, samples using a USRP um, with uh, 11 different modulations. Okay, uh, each modulation there is a, a, a the the signals are, are modulated by, at a different uh, twenty different kind of a signal noise ratio levels. Okay, so um, then e at each level there are, there are, there are one thousand samples. Okay, and um, each sample consists of one twenty eight consecutive uh, I and Q uh, data units. Then the authors then use the uh, CNN model like this. So it has a, uh, this is a, the input, okay, input layer. So we, because we have IQ, okay, we have IQ data units. So that is two here, then uh, uh, 28 uh, values. So that is two times 128. Then uh, it followed by the, these uh, convolution layers Okay, then there's a dense layer, then there's two dense layers, then eventually the output is like a tell you, uh, the output tells you uh, which the input signal, okay, so which uh, which uh, is modulated with which of these 11 uh, modulation techniques. So um, the idea is that we want to, because this 1000, 1000 samples for each SNR level, that seems not very not very big. So we want to see if we can uh, synthesize uh, data, okay, and use the synthesized data to improve the performance of this uh, CN model. So the idea is to uh, explore this uh, generative generative adversarial network model. So uh, such models uh, has a uh, it has a generative model G generator and a discriminate discriminative model D. Okay, so the generator generates samples okay, from uh, from random noise. It's here, random noise, then so gener generator, then it generates uh, samples. And then the discriminator, 
okay, it will distinguish, it will try to distinguish this generated fake, we, we call it fake or generated examples from those real data, uh, real data samples from the field, for example, okay. So then these two, G and D, generate and discriminator, they will uh, compete with each, with each other until some, um, uh, until eventually the discriminator is not able to distinguish between these two, the real data and the fake data. Then that means the generated data from random noise is so, has the same distribution, it's so similar to the real data. So it can be used as a real data. So, so that's the idea. Okay, but the problem is that uh, uh, this GAN model is a un it's a unsupervised learning, so it cannot use to generate labeled data. Well, for for this CN, if we if we want to train this CN model, we need to we need to have a labeled data. Okay, so that means we we have this input, this I IQ data units here that we need to know uh, the ground truth for this data. This data, so which modulation it is. We need labels. So then the idea we uh, we propose is to use conditional gain, okay? So that is a, a, a new model of this uh, gain. So uh, it use, it's a condition, the both G and D are conditioned on auxiliary information. Uh, that is uh, that is the class label Y. So here you can see the class label Y is also input to the generator and the input to the discriminator, okay, so, and this way we can generate a, a conditional, uh, we can generate a, a labeled data, okay, so, so eventually the, the, the synthesized the data from this generator will be indiscriminate, uh, it cannot be distinguished from those real data and they are labeled data. Um, so here are the uh, examples we, 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 we uh, through our uh, experiments, uh, we, we got in our experiments. So the on the left side, left hand side are the original data in this uh, in, in this uh, data set. Okay, public data set. On the on, on the right hand side is the uh, synthesized data, and um, so this each pair of figures. So each pair of figures corresponding to a different uh, modulation techniques like AM single sideband. Uh, BPSK like this, like a ring. Okay, so um, you can see the, the synthesized the data visually. They look very uh, similar to the uh, original data. And uh, here are more modulation types like uh, uh, GPS, GFSK, QEM sixteen, uh, etc. And um, so then we fit this uh, synthesized data. Okay, into the um, into this uh, CNN model, okay, then we, we want to see it, what can we get out of it, right? So, so these are the uh, training uh, results. On the left-hand side, so we use the 1,000 uh, uh, units of synthesized samples, and the right-hand side is uh, 5,000. So we, we, we have more data now uh, on the right-hand side. You can see, uh, uh, so, on the right left hand side, so the convergence maybe happens after six or seventy uh, epochs, and uh, on the left hand side, convergence after like maybe twenty or twenty five uh, epochs, and uh, the loss, okay, a training, both for the training loss and the validation loss, so you can see this on the right hand side is about 0.2 after convergence. And on the left hand side is 0.4. So basically, both the uh, CN training, okay, CN training uh, can greatly benefit, uh, can be benefit from, can benefit from the uh, this uh, augmented data, synthesized the data, okay, produced by C, the CGAN model. So it can achieve faster convergence and smaller training loss. And uh, how about the uh, classification um, classification performance? So basically, that's indicated by that this uh, confusion matrix. So this figure F, figure F, that is the original. Uh, uh, that is the here, the original radio ML twenty sixteen data set. There's a uh, one thousand samples for each uh, uh, SNR level and each uh, modulation type, and using this uh, CN model. 
So you can see there are like a scattered uh, these uh, blocks. Okay, so that means uh, the high kind of a classification error. So then we increase the uh, samples data size from with 1,000 additional synthesized samples, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. So you can see here, it's a very clean um, um, classification result. So basically, uh, synthesized data helps to uh, to give you better performance. And uh, uh, the accuracy, classification, classification accuracy, as indicated by the F1, F1 score, is uh, plotted here. So this uh, orange line, so that is the original uh, CNN performance with the original data set. And uh, this green line, that that's uh, obtained by uh, using uh, additional like 5,000 uh, synthesized uh, data units, data for examples for each modulation at each uh, uh, SNR level. So you can you can see uh, this uh, synthesized data that does uh, improve the performance of uh, CNN classify, yeah, of uh, this uh, automatic modulation classification. So this idea can be generalized. So uh, not just for uh, for uh, this uh, AMC problem, right? So there are many other problems where where it's a very it's costly and it's hard, difficult to collect data from the field. Then maybe you can uh, collect a, a few uh, seed data, a small set of data. Then applying this model, then to applying this model, you can generate synthesized data to make, to to achieve good performance. Okay, so that's the the point here. So our data augmentation that that's helpful and it's a, a useful tool. And uh, the second uh, case study is uh, is also uh, we also study a classical kind of problem. So the problem is uh, uh, energy efficiency maximization. Okay, so like a, a wireless network here, so we have these links, red, red dot is transmitter, blue dot is the receiver. Okay, then they interfere with each other in the same, same frequency uh, range. Okay, so the energy efficiency, um, so that is defined to be the, the total rate achieved, okay, by uh, all these links. Uh, divided by the power, uh, the, the cost you pay. Okay, so this is the what you gain, uh, data rate you gain and power you pay. So um, by tuning the, the transmit power of all these transmitters, okay, and uh, the transmit power is uh, bounded by this uh, uh, peak power constraint. So this is a very uh, well-studied problem, a classical problem in wireless communications, wireless networks. So, but because of this uh, fractional format, Okay, so um, it make it very hard to uh, for conventional to apply for conventional convex optimization theory. Okay, and it's actually proved in the in these papers. It's actually NP hard, and um, it, it it's hard to get global optimal. Okay, with but unless you pay uh, exponentially growing complexity. Okay, and uh, some uh, techniques have been like duality theory and fractional programming can be applied for suboptimal solutions. And um, another technique, branch bound, branch and bound, uh, we, we, we used in this paper, okay. And uh, with this uh, reformulation linear, linearization technique, so basically we keep, keep on relaxing using uh, um, relaxing the, uh, the object function or non, the non-convex op 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 object function or constraints, okay. So until we get a linear, relaxed linear and uh, uh, problem, okay, then apply branch and bound. You can fix those like a binary kind of uh, uh, variables and down until you, uh, until you get some, uh, some um, solution then but that solution may not be feasible to the original problem because of the relaxations. And then we need to uh, design some local search algorithm to find a nearby a feasible solution to the original problem. Okay, then that give you a suboptimal solution. So, and uh, we also tried this uh, successive pseudo convex approximation. So it's a similar approach. So we want to approximate the object function. Okay with functions that have uh, like convexity, okay. And uh, that the way to do this is we can use a Taylor series expansion then take the first order uh, 
components. Okay, so and then keep on uh, relaxing the problem down till we. Uh, but uh, it, it it is proven that with this technique, um, the because of this uh, pseudo -con concavity property, okay, that ensures the resulted uh, for the for the relaxed problem, all the stationary points are also global global optimal for the approximated problem. Okay, so then eventually we can get a, a solution, okay, to the approximated problem. So which is actually a suboptimal solution to our original problem. So this works, but uh, uh, we found that the computation, computational cost is very high, okay. It takes a lot of time to uh, to compute the solution. So then we, 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 th we thought about uh, deep learning. Okay, can we apply deep learning to uh, solve this uh, such a complex problem? Okay, so we try, first of all, we, we try that this uh, DNN, uh, deep neural network model, it's a feed forward DNN. So three hidden layers with 200 neurons, 150 neurons, okay, in these layers. And then we also try the uh, power, we, we call it power net. So we also try, it is a convolutional neural network based model. Okay, so we have this input layer, then convolution layers. And then this, this is the block, we call it the residual learning block. The reason is that we have a shortcut from the input to the output. So this is a residual learning block. Okay, that the benefit the advantage of this uh, architecture is that uh, you can mitigate the uh, vanishing gradient problem. Okay, so, and you can, when the problem gets more and more complex, you can stack a large number of these residual blocks. You get a very deep architecture. Okay. So we, we try this too. But uh, the problem is that uh, uh, we need to train these models with data. So where do we get data to train these models to make them work? So, um, but we, we, we will not be able to uh, measure data in a field. So uh, the idea is that uh, we, uh, we use the, uh, this SPCA algorithm. Okay, so the theoretical, we use the theoretical model here and the theoretical solution here, traditional like optimization solution here. And uh, for each random location of the transmitter receivers, okay? So then we use this uh, SPCA algorithm to compute the power allocation, suboptimal power allocation PIs. And this constitute a, a training data unit. Then we repeat this, okay, generate random locations, this DIJ, then compute the power allocation, then we, until we get a training data set. Because this training is, uh, uh, you, you don't need to do it uh, Often, right? So it's just uh, we we just need the training data to 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 train the network. Once it's trained, you can use it. Okay, so the inference will be very fast. And uh, then we use this uh, input DIJ, and the label is the power allocation computed by the SPCA algorithm here. So the input is DIJ, and then the output is the uh, inferred the transmit power of by this. Uh, uh, machine learning models, deep learning models. Okay, so the training is to minimize the loss function, a loss function that that's the difference between two. Okay, the the label and the, the estimated power. So here are some uh, training uh, results. So uh, this is for the DNN model. This is the for the power net model. So um, you can see the convergence is quite fast. Uh, the difference is that, um, so these three curves are for different number of nodes. This is a five node network, 10 node network and 30 node network. When the network size incre is increased, then the DNN model will suffer. Okay, it does not, it, you, you can see that the training loss is keep, keeps on increasing. Well, the power net, because of this uh, residual uh, learning architecture, it can handle very, large amount of data, very complex cases. You can stack more uh, residual blocks. Okay, so so um, it, it's better at handling large size of the networks. But uh, when the network size is not that large, it's worse than uh, the DNN model. So uh, here we show the um, results. Okay, the energy efficiency 
results for uh, two networks, five nodes and 30 nodes. So um, there are five curves. This, this black curve at the top, so that is the, um, the results computed by the, uh, this uh, SPC algorithm. Okay, so, and uh, that, that, that's actually an upper bound. Okay, then we have this uh, uh, results computed by the DNN model and the power net model. So when the network size is small, then the power net mo model is a little bit worse than the lower than the DNN model. But when the net network size is increased, then uh, the power net model performs better. Okay. We also try the like a maximum power transmission and naive naive scheme, and the random power allocation uh, two naive schemes. So they they also, they bo both suffer when the uh, when the power peak power constraint is very low or very high. Okay. So here are some more uh, data. So uh, if you look at this column, we try the different the pass loss models. Okay, shadowing and the uh, fast fading pass loss. This is like a, the the channel against determined by distance only. Okay, so like a free space kind of a model. So um, you can see the uh, this power net and DN models. They can achieve uh, like a eighty percent, ninety percent performance in uh, energy efficiency as compared to SPCA uh, does. Okay, and um, when um, also when when the network size is increased from five to thirty. Okay, so um, this uh, power net becomes better than uh, the DN model. Okay, and then. So basically, this is not very exciting because you see the there's a gap. Okay, we cannot achieve the a better performance than the uh, this uh, optimization uh, solution. Okay, so but uh, if you look at the time time execution time of the algorithms, so the the two machine learning models they only use like a 0.17 percent of the time that used by the uh, optimization model. So it's much, much faster than the, uh, so it can be uh, uh, used in practice. Okay. So I think the, the issue is that uh, those, these machine learning models, they, uh, their performance depending on what kind of data you have. Okay, so yeah, if you give them better data, then they, they will perform better. But uh, that's why they cannot perform better than the SPC algorithm, which generates data to, to train the models. So the, the last example uh, is a is a, a very different uh, new problem we, we investigated. Okay, it's on 3D human skeleton tra tracking. So the idea is that, uh, for example, uh, we have video cameras, we capture the uh, this uh, video, okay, then we can from the video, we can reconstruct the a skeleton for each of the uh, subject. Okay, so then that's a that can be used can can have a lot of uh, applications. Okay, it's an important component for like human computer interaction. Uh, I I I remember the uh, there's some like a, a movies Mission Impossible maybe. So when 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 this guy Ethan enters the uh, um, the CIA headquarters, so basically there's a, a, the skeleton was captured and the, the, the pace, uh, the pose and pace are, are used to uh, authenticate uh, if the spy is the, is the right person. So it's something like that. So uh, what we have done is we, uh, we use uh, RFID tags, okay, to, uh, to, for the sensing application. So we attach RFID tags to the human body, okay. Then we have these uh, RFID um, readers. These are the three antennas. They, they keep on interrogating those tags and collect the readings from the text. Then by measuring the, uh, the face, uh, face angle from this uh, received the tag response signal, then analyze those signal. Okay, we, we pre-process the signal and fit it into a neural network model. Okay, then we, we try to use this uh, RFID face in information to reconstruct uh, a human pose in 3D space. 
the benefit for this comparing to uh, there, there are like a, a computer vision based, uh, video camera based uh, solutions, okay, that works very well. The benefit is that uh, uh, many people probably they don't feel comfortable if uh, to have a video camera uh, looking at you all the time, right? So, so this is uh, non intrusive, okay? So uh, it's just uh, radio signals, you don't see it, and uh, you can better uh, protect the privacy of the, uh, of the subjects. And uh, we use uh, a Kindle, a uh, Kindle model, okay, to uh, to to generate a label the vision data and use the, this vision data to uh, with uh, to supervise the training of this uh, uh, neural network. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And uh, so this is a system setup. So we have the three antennas. Okay, and um, so th that is the RFID reader. And this is computer uh, control this uh, the uh, reading uh, of the text, and, the, and we have uh, twelve texts attached to the to the joints. Uh, 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 this is my student Chao Yang, yeah, to, attached to the to the joints of the body. Then um, then we can um, yeah. Let me. Uh, yeah, then we can uh, capture uh, the. The movements of the uh, reconstruct a 3D like a skeleton of the to represent the movements of the body. So on the uh, this blue skeleton that is captured by the uh, by the Kindle, okay, uh, cameras, okay, and this uh, red uh, skeleton that is uh, reconstructed from this uh, RFID signals uh, collected uh, from those texts attached to his body. You can see. Uh, it works very well. It's a real time, okay, and okay. So then, one challenge for this is that uh, um, is uh, so basically when if, even if you uh, you even if the subject is making the same motion, okay, same kind of activity, but uh, the readings could be very different if there's a change, slight change of the antenna position or the standing position of the subject. Uh, like these two figures, this shows the, uh, uh, shows the, uh, I think uh, 10 tags, the face angle read from 10 tags, okay, RFID tags, so at different times. Then uh, this, I, when, when the subject, when child was standing at different locations, okay, domain, we call it different domains, domain one, domain two. You can see this RFID, uh, facing face data are very different uh, but although he was making this doing the same kind of activity okay so uh, it is shown in this figure so we have three antennas here so in front of the antenna we have uh, six actually seven okay different locations and the, another location is uh, uh, very different that is outside the computer lab in a corridor, okay. So the propagation environment is very different. Then uh, we train the model, okay, for data collected at position one, position two, position three, okay. Then we, if we test the the person, okay, at this same locations, then these are the errors we 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 got either four or three or four centimeters on average. But if we if the person is standing at an untrained location, then the error will be much larger. Okay, so this is actually a, a common problem. Not not just I, I'm just using this as an example. So it's a generalization, generalization of your uh, machine learning model. So if uh, how how to uh, get good performance uh, for uh, untrained kind of domain or untrained data set? Okay, so that's a general uh, general. Uh, uh, transfer learning kind of uh, or, uh, adaptation or generalization kind of uh, problem. So uh, we propose to use a uh, metadata, a uh, meta learning actually, meta learning. So that is a machine learning technique. Okay, so to address this uh, generalization problem. Uh, before this work, we, we apply the meta learning to predict uh, uh, the the power consumption of uh, uh, appliances in a, in a household, in a house. Okay, so we, we can show that uh, if you train the model using data appliance, 
electricity uh, consumption data from one house, then we can apply it to uh, test in another house, a different house, and still we, we can still get a very good performance. Okay, so that the benefit is that uh, we don't need we can provide protect the privacy of the second house. We don't need to get use their data to train retrain the model again. So it, that that works very well. So that motiv motivates us to apply the technique here at this RFID business sensing problem. So what is meta learning? Is to learn the learning algorithm itself. So it is also known, known as a learning to learn, okay? So basically we want to train a general model that can generalize across different tasks of data sets, untrained data sets. So it, it, the model can learn and adapt quickly uh, by um, the so-called field shot learning. So we only, uh, when, when adapt to applied to a new data domain, we only need to, we need none or maybe a few, very few, uh, new examples, new data collected from from the new domain, and then to uh, fine tune the the meta learning model. Okay, then it will work well, give you a very good performance. Okay, so so basically there are two uh, stages, two two steps. The first step is to train the model. Okay, we, we want to uh, well initialize the 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 deep learning parameters. Okay. Uh, some uh, good initialization, okay, so good good values, okay. So, in the pre pre training, uh, it's called also called pre training model, okay. In the pre training phase, then when applied to a new domain, okay, you you use an uh, untrained data set for inference, okay. Then we need a, a small um, number of uh, a few new examples from the new data set to fine tune. The parameters of the model. Okay, then it will work well. So let's uh, in this figure. So basically, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, actually a auto encoder, recurrent uh, encoder, and a recurrent decoder. So let's for uh, denoising. Okay, so we can uh, extract the features. Okay, from this RFID uh, face data uh, to get this uh, quaternion uh, sequence. Okay, then we feed this quaternion sequence into a forward kinematic uh, network that translates this uh, quaternion sequence into a, a 3D skeleton. Okay, while well, this uh, initial skeleton is used uh, as uh, input information. And uh, during the training, we use a uh, Kinect uh, vi vision data as a uh, um, for supervised training. Okay, so, um, so specifically, we um, we have uh, here, uh, sorry, no. So we have uh, different uh, domains, like uh, like it's like a different antenna placements or different uh, location of the subject. Okay, so as as you know, in, in Wallace propagation, when, when the place, when the location is uh, shifted by half a wavelength, then you probably you'll get a very different uh, uh, channel uh, signal power, right? Receive the signal power. So we have uh, like a, we data, we collect data from four uh, data domains, four different locations, okay? Then we also apply uh, domain fusion, fusion uh, algorithm. So that is, that is, we randomly sample data from these different domains to construct the new domains, okay? The idea is to we want to have a very diverse kind of the different types of the domains and use that to train the model, okay? Then we use this to, this, uh, this uh, fused domains to train the metapos uh, to initialize its parameters. Then uh, when applied to a new domain, uh, we, like a DT, a target domain DT that has not been trained. Okay, the data may have a very different distribution. Okay, as from those uh, trained trained data sets. Okay, then we we sample a few samples. Okay, from the this uh, DT, then use this to uh, fine tune the parameters, and then eventually we can apply the fine tune model to this new domain DT. So, um, in our experiment. We have a uh, uh, three. Uh, we, no, we have uh, eight uh, different uh, locations. 
means, okay, D1, D2, D3, D7. It designed in a computer lab with cluttered environment. And this is the, the, the ace uh, position is in a corridor. There's a, it's empty, okay, very clean environment. Then we use D1 to D4 to train the model, okay, to pre-train the model. Then we apply the pre-train model with fine tuning Okay, to D5 to D8, and to, we want to see how, how well they, they, the performance will be. Um, so here, in this figure, the blue bars are pre-trained model. Okay, so you can see for D1, D2, D3, D4, because the these four data sets are used in the training model. So when we apply this to the model to these four domains, then we get a kind of a four point something a three point something uh, error. But if you apply this trend model to an un untrained uh, data sets, D5, D6, D7, D8, then you get high errors, okay? But after fine tuning, okay, fine tuning means we, we get, a, we, we use a very few three or four, okay, examples from this new uh, data set to fine tune the parameters, then the error we are reduced to the same level as these are trained data sets, okay? The error for untrained data sets, okay, after fine tuning, they are comparable to those errors in the in trained data sets. And we also tested how many, like uh, how many uh, new examples, right? New examples you, you want to use to fine tune the, it's called a field, field shot training. So, okay, how many, um, like one shot, two shots, three shots, four shots, five shots. Yeah, so basically uh, it, with more data, new data is used, the, the error generally will decrease, okay. And we also tried uh, like a different, uh, um, for th this figure is for different data set, new data sets, D D5 to D8, they are untrained new data sets. And we also try different uh, uh, activities like, uh, like twisting the body, walking, standing skill and arm waving. Okay, so so basically we found uh, uh, we don't need uh, too many new data from the untrained uh, data sets. Maybe four shot fine tuning would be sufficient. Okay, and um, with the uh, this uh, approach, mental learning approach, the overall data for the for these four untrained data sets, the data is less than four centimeters. The error is less than four uh, centimeters. Okay, and uh, for this uh, uh, original uh, baseline scheme, then that is uh, 6.27 centimeters. So it's uh, like a, a, around 37% uh, of a reduction of error by this uh, meta learning approach. So um, so those are the three uh, case studies we, we tried. So actually this uh, this is just an example. We uh, we applied it to this uh, uh, 3D post sensing problem, but in many other wireless communications networking problems, you can, I, I, I believe this meta learning approach will also work and uh, give you a, a good performance. So so what are the uh, uh, challenges? And uh, yeah, so what are the uh, open problems? So basically um, there's a platform data set and benchmark. Okay, so we need a, this is all needed, okay, in great need to, to, to promote the research in the, in the area, okay. And uh, one question uh, need to be answered is like, uh, we need a high quality labeled data. Now how many, how much data do you need? Okay, so that is uh, the sample complexity problem. There has been some recent interesting work on this, okay. Uh, that may be applied. And also we, we can apply data augmentation and data imputation, okay. Like uh, uh, we, we try the tensor completion, okay, so that works very well. And uh, so we can, because we cannot uh, measure uh, what is uh, like spectrum data at every time, every location, every frequency. So there, there will be always big gap in frequency in different space, location, and in time, right? So, so we, sometimes we need, uh, uh, so data, imputation or augmentation to 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 interpolate or, or extrapolate the, the missing data. And and um, 
machine learning performance will be as good as your training data. So we need to um, make sure the consistency between your training data and the real deployment. And then we need a repeatable results. Okay, so uh, recently on, on uh, social, social media group, people complained about uh, like uh, the recent machine learning papers. Okay, so many results are not reproducible. So, so I think we need to promote repeatable results and uh, uh, share the code, share the data set, okay. And another uh, interesting direction is, uh, we, we talk about uh, applying machine learning to uh, wireless problems, but there is also uh, the other uh, aspect is how to use wireless technologies to make machine learning more efficient, right? And um, um, so we we also need a, a performance guarantees like a worst case performance uh, uh, guarantees. So that that's that means we need a robustness okay, in training and in inference, we have bounded performance. We also uh, also our wireless um, applications, uh, wireless networks are dynamic. Okay, people are moving, devices are moving. So we need a fast convergence like field short learning. Okay, so for example. Uh, they are having like a um, machine learning, deep learning models for channel estimation. So then what if the environment is changed? What if the transmitter moves? Okay, then do you need uh, to retrain the model? Okay, so um, also um, data, usually wireless data are sparse and noisy. Okay, we need uh, to pre-process the data and data imputation and um, Generalization, okay, is a, a important uh, topic. So we, uh, when when the model, when the environment changes, the main changes, how do you generalize? How do you, uh, up, how how the model can adapt to new uh, to those changes? Okay, and um, uh, if you think more, then uh, historically we have the theory and the models. Okay. Uh, Although they are not uh, ideal, okay, not may, many cases they're not accurate at all, but uh, they they uh, generate, they, they triggered, they drove the development a lot of theory, okay, so that in communications and networks. So uh, machine learning, uh, mostly many models are black box models, so, but people are gaining, developing theory, okay, theoretical models understanding of machine learning models. So the question is, can we use a machine learning AI to also to uh, uh, derive, bring about new theory and breakthroughs uh, in the field, okay, as traditional model did. And uh, we need to know why a model works and why it does not work. So that's explainable, explainable okay. And um, also uh, wireless networks, uh, it's always like a distributed uh, and federated learning would be uh, useful. And um, another consideration is that we need to look at, uh, uh, yeah, many times people always assume the wireless, wireless thing is the bottleneck because the low rate and reliability in, uh, interruptions. But uh, if, if we have like a very high rate, okay, very reliable links for wireless, networks, then maybe the, the wireline network, your de, your, de, de, your 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 cable modern, for example, will be the bottleneck and the, some uh, wireline switches, okay, so, or the backhaul yeah, of the network, okay. So there will be a new uh, bottleneck we need to uh, look at. So eventually it's, a, I think it's a application that is very important. So we need to have a, some success uh, stories, okay, cases, uh, success in, 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 in the wireless field about with uh, machine learning techniques, okay. Um, so to, uh, to make it fly. Um, so in conclusion, I, I think uh, while people are uh, talking about 5G and 6G, so um, maybe uh, this intelligence AI and machine learning could be a key component and common theme of the new generation. Um, so uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, challenges and interesting problems remain and that need uh, more uh, more uh, research efforts. So um, that's all I have. Yeah, so I think I, yeah, some 10 minutes over, over the, yeah. 
Okay, thank you so much. Like, uh, let's thank for the speaker. Thank you. Okay, any questions? So now you can ask questions. Uh, yeah, I, I'm curious. Back on slide 20, you introduced the idea of of okay. the CGAN training. Sure. Um, and I'm I'm still trying to get get my mind around the idea of of what what the generative model is generating. It's it says it's generating samples from random noise, um, but then when we look at plots on the next page or two, um, there's some amount of structure. So so what is it that we're generating? Uh, so the input to the generator is a random noise. Then it will generate some samples, like a uh, uh, like this IQ data, okay, of a Wallis uh, modulation of a modulation type. Then uh, this data generated model, a uh, generated sample may be uh, very poor, uh, very different from a real real sample. Its input is is fit into this uh, discriminator. Then the discriminator will compare this from uh, with the uh, real data, IQ data, then you can decide if it's a real one or it's a fake zero, right? Then this information, the real fake information will be used in the, it's incorporated in the loss function and used to train this uh, gener generator. So the generator will get more and uh, smarter when, when it tries different uh, kind of uh, uh, examples generated from the random noise, then it, it will then based on the real and the fake this feedback. So it becomes smarter. So eventually, it can, it will feel be able to fool the discriminator. So so basically, that means um, the discriminator cannot distinguish from a real data unit data sample from a generated data sample. Then that means the training is uh, com accomplished. Then we can use this generator to synthesize, uh, like uh, this uh, data, which has the same distribution and looks like the the real. So uh, the implementation of this generator and discriminator, uh, discriminator, uh, there is like a, a deep uh, a, a deep neural network. So it's basically a deep neural network, and uh, we we use this uh, loss function that that is in, incorporates this uh, eventual this uh, fake, real fake output as feedback to train this the parameters in these two neural networks. So to to make this generator smarter and smarter, eventually it can uh, generate uh, from random noise the the distribution that looks like uh, real data. So is the idea that the discriminator is a neural network and it gets trained on real data initially. And then right. a second neural network um, is used for the generator and it, it runs until it can fool the discriminator, at which point you have a larger body of, of training data. And at that, point, um, at that point, using this broader set of data, um, the, the discriminator just gets retrained until it's somewhat better and the confusion matrices improve. Is that kind of the principle? Uh, uh, yeah, in some sense, yes. So basically, uh, once we train this model, so when, when we stop, so that, that we stop when we have this real data coming and this the synthesized data coming, so the discriminator cannot tell the difference. So that means we this generator has been trained so to generate a, data with the same distribution, same features, same as uh, real data. So then we don't, uh, after beyond this, we don't need a discriminator anymore. So we just use this generator to continue to synthesize data, new samples coming out. And those are the uh, here, uh, like here, uh, 5,000 synthesized samples and 1,000 synthesized. So those are the, uh, new uh, augmented data we, we can make use to train. Eventually, we use the, those data to train this uh, CNN model. So this CNN model will tell us uh, to classify the, uh, you, you have a random signal coming, then the, this CNN model will tell you which modulation technique scheme 
it is used. It was uh, modulated like this. Now this CNN model is not the same thing as the discriminator or it is the discriminator? No, it's different. So, yeah, this model is only used to, uh, to generate a synthesized data. And okay. uh, once we have synthesized the data, so then we use that to, uh, so basically this CNN model is used for, uh, auto, uh, it's called AMC, automatic modulation classification. So we have uh, this uh, uh, IQ data, I mean, fit into this, then the output will tell you uh, Q, is QPSK, is a GFSK, or is which modulation technique it, it was modulated with. So if I understand you correctly, <clears throat> You need you need that uh, augmented data because you don't have enough data in the uh, radio exactly. data set in the first place. Yeah, exactly. the The original data set it has a one thousand examples for each signal noise ratio level and uh, uh, for each modulation scheme. So uh, then, if we increase it to like a, like a five thousand, okay. So uh, so basically here we increase it. Uh, by 1,000, 2,000, by 5,000. So then the, uh, this uh, uh, automatic modulation classification performance that's achieved by this CNN model, it will be uh, the accuracy will be keep on in, improved. So more data, more data give you better uh, classification. Uh, it, with more data, we can train the CNN model better so we can get a better performance. Thank you. Yeah. So, so as you said, uh, these two are different. So, so this uh, uh, C GAN model is used to generate augmented uh, data. Okay. Then we use this augmented data to train this same model for uh, automatic modulation classification. Um, but isn't it against the idea of generalizability? So, if we have lots of is similar data mean, from the similar source. So is it against that uh, capability to generalize to something that was not similar to the same source? Um, yeah, if you, uh, it, it is like, if I understand your question. So, uh, so basically we have a real uh, measured data from the field or from USRP device, okay, those are the real data. That is uh, as input to the discriminator, okay. So the discriminator will tell the difference between these two. So basically we are using this real data to guide the training of this generator until the generator um, will be tuned. So it can generate the same data with the same distribution, same features as the real data. So. Yeah, if you use a different kind of data, then the generator will be uh, trained differently. But I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if I answered your question. So yeah, I'm saying that if we generate the same data over and over, then uh -huh. isn't it the case that the system that we train later, those CNN, will not respond well to unseen data? Uh, yeah, we 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 say it's it generates the same data, but uh, we we actually mean the same kind of uh, distribution, same features. It, they're not exactly the same same values. So, um, like here, so we, it, so this gen this uh, synthesized data looks very similar to, but, but uh, there there are random noises and uh, they're small. Uh, displacement mm -hmm. of the uh, constellation, you know, yeah. So yeah, I think you, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. If I understand your question, so uh, we we have not uh, considered the generalization problem in uh, in this work. So this work is focused on data augmentation. So that that's if you have insufficient, a small amount of data, how do you synthesize? a large amount of data with the same features, same distribution, then you can use that to improve the performance of this uh, uh, model. Then, but if you use a different distribution, if you train this model with one distribution, one data set, 
it may work may not work well uh, if you have an untrained data set use that to test this model so so i think uh, yeah so that is a general generalization problem so that's addressed in in, in the the last piece like a meta learning approach if you use meta learning and if you should train fine tuning then the model can adapt to a, a untrained data set so also give you good performance I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, so I'm on the modulations that you pick. All of them sounds to be single carrier modulation. Why we know that 5G and 6G um, focus more on uh, multi-carrier modulations, right? So I'm wondering, uh, having the multi-carrier modulation, how will affect the uh, system model or if there is any restriction or limitation to have like single carrier modulation and multi-carrier modulation together? If we want to recognize that, you know, um, I, I I haven't tried that. So, but my my guess is that uh, so these these three examples I, I uh, we 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 tried they are basically they address uh, three three problems in in machine learning for wireless, right? So the first one is if you if the cost of collecting data is uh, high. And you, or if you're not able to collect a lot of data, then how do you, what do you do? You, you can augment your data, you can synthesize, right? You synthesize the data, but it's to get very good performance. The second question is uh, um, how to combine, make use of those like uh, 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 theoretical models, model-based and model-free kind of approaches. We can make use of model-based uh, uh, approach to, to generate uh, theoretically generate compute those like a uh, training data to train the model but we still, we can still get good performance with uh, at a very faster speed okay the third one is uh, generalization how do you so once you train a model with some known data set how do you apply it to an unknown data set in a new environment so i think these are very general it, um, it should be work if you consider some other kind of modulation in 5G or future mod techniques in 6G. Uh, if you have uh, access to the data, yeah, it should. Uh, okay, but you are saying we can generalize this model to have single carrier and multi carrier modulation all together, and still the model can recognize the modulation, right? Uh, could you say that again? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so um, my question is, this model can be generalized then to have yeah. single carrier and multi-carrier modulations all together, and still the model can work and can recognize the modulation technique, right? Is that yeah. right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what basically these are the, uh, it's a very powerful models. So you can, yeah, you can apply it to uh, many like, problems. Yeah, yeah I, I like it, thank you so much. <laughs> And uh, also, uh, there are a lot of codes available and a lot of uh, open source like uh, platforms. So uh, it's very easy to, to learn and uh, to, to make use of them. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I, I think the harder, pro harder part is, uh, is in the last few slides. So how do you know how, mu how much data you, you need in order to get a, a target performance, something like that. Or how do you um, bound, get, get, how do you get some performance guarantee? So basically uh, it's easy to use it as a black box kind of approach, but, it, but a, a lot of work is needed to, uh, to, to understand or to develop the theory to understand what these models. Yeah. Oh, any other questions? Uh, may I ask a few questions? Sure, sure. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Wang. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. It's nice to see a variety of applications of machine learning. Um, I just have a, a question regarding the second application that you talked about, yeah. the energy um, yeah. minimization one. Yeah. Oh, maximization. Okay. Yeah, my question is, if I understood it correctly, uh, you are using a supervised learning uh, setup where you are using this conventional algorithm SPCA as your uh, benchmark, right? So you define your loss function 
uh, accordingly. Uh, I was wondering, did you try an unsupervised learning setting? Because you could just try to maximize the energy without using results from the SPCA algorithm, right? Yeah, we, we, we haven't tried that. So yeah, it might be an interesting problem to, to, uh, to, to pursue. Yeah, so it, it, anything like a, that can reduce the re dependency on data, that would be good. Yeah, I, I, like I, was, I wasn't sure whether the SPA, SPCA algorithm is optimal. If it's suboptimal, it's if it's suboptimal, then when you do unsupervised learning, maybe you can beat <laughs> the SPCA. Yeah, right. yeah. It, it could be, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, also, for that training, for, for that particular application, I was wondering in your training data, do you assume the same path loss model? Uh, we, we tried uh, different uh, models. Uh, it's here. It's, yeah, it, there, there, there's a pass loss model, so that's like a free space model, and a shadowing model, and the fast fading. Uh, this is the uh, leading model. So the input to the to the these neural networks is uh, just location of the devices, and the output is the uh, power assignment. So basically, pass model is uh, considered in this uh, SPC. Oh, so it's uh, considered oh. in, the data, in the training data already. Yeah. Oh, oh, I think, let me rephrase my question. So in your training data, does it contain all different kinds of pass loss model or it's a single kind? A single kind. Yeah, single. Oh, it's a single kind. Okay, so you don't consider a mixture of different pass loss models within the same training set. We, we, we didn't try. So oh, okay. uh, the problem is that the, the first case is that you can uh, collect the real data, like a location, then power, power allocation. This, this is one data unit. If we can collect right. in a real field, that is a real channel model. Okay, real propagation, whatever, multipass. But uh, that is not doable. So, so that's why we, uh, yeah. Oh. We, yeah, we, yeah we I, I was thinking if your uh, user is moving, then the path loss might change. Yeah, so um, that's uh, user mobility, that's, that's considered in this uh, DIG. So when we generate uh, this training data set, we generate a random locations of the transmitters uh, and, the, and the receivers. And then for each random location, uh, distribution of the nodes, then we apply this algorithm mm -hmm. with a certain channel model. We derive the suboptimal power assignments. Then use this to, then we change the location, then we get power mm -hmm. assignment, then use this to train model. So that's what we did. Right, so when your location change, your past loss would change. Yeah. Uh, but you are using the same model. Yeah, that's I, captured, I see. Uh, that's captured mm -hmm. in the, in the training data, so so that's captured in the trend model. So right. we only need the locations, then we. Okay. But uh, but uh, this is not uh, uh, this is still a centralized algorithm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question I had is in your um, presentation, you used a lot about the CNN. Um, right. Maybe in your third application, were you using the RNN because the motion yeah. is continuous? Were you Using the RNN in that setting? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, here, this is autoencoder. So mm -hmm. it's this is the recurrent. We have LSTM model embedded in this. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So in this case, I guess, did you compare with CNN to see whether indeed the RNN gives you better performance than the CNN? Yeah, we, um, I, I don't remember, but. Uh, I think we tried uh, uh, different models and then this works well. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because okay. it's a uh, human, it's a uh, uh, pose and uh, human activities, uh, it's like a time series. Right, right. So memory yeah. would be helpful. Uh, 3D, 3D time series. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, hi. I have uh, some quick question about the conditional GAN, and yeah, I'm wondering how to apply class label input to the generator and discriminator network in structural point of view. 
it may not just add another input to the network, right? Um, let me think. Well, what... So how to apply the, this class label input to the network? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I wish my students is here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I think I have a slide. Uh, just give me a second. Uh -huh. um, I have a hidden slide. Uh, uh, it's here. So uh -huh. um, yeah, I, I don't remember, but it, it, it could be like an additional input to the uh, to the neural networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can uh, check it out and uh, you, if you send an email, so I, I can. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a good question. So, yeah. Um, great. Any other questions? Okay, if there's no further questions, let's thank for the speaker again for the great talk. Yeah, so you can see that, you know, so yeah, we are really interested in, in technology here. So usually we have lots of questions after the talk. So that's why we don't care about the time. <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, okay, so uh, let's end here. Thank you for coming. So let's, let's uh, meet again uh, in the next distinguished talk. Okay. See you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for accepting Thank our invitation. Great talk. Thanks.